uh, yes sir good afternoon sir anjan sir yeah hi good afternoon uh, hello sir i am sudeshna sir uh, yeah hi hi sudeshna uh, hello sir yes uh, hello uh, yes good sir, afternoon uh, yes uh should should we share your ppt and check or are you comfortable with team sir just to check on that uh if you can give me the presenter controls already I... given sir already given okay yeah so i'll i'll be able to share my screen yes is my audio fine yes your audio is fine sir okay awesome so we'll start maybe in 5 minutes yes sir and the participants are uh, still joining Oh. Okay. Okay. And, um, yes. Uh, by three we can start, sir. Okay.
Uh, okay, let us start. Uh, others will join as in when. Um, good afternoon to one and all. Welcome to the fourth session of the faculty development program organized by the Department of Media Studies, Reva University. I, Dr. Sudeshna Das, Assistant Professor in Media Studies, will be the host for today's session. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, data is defined as information, especially facts or numbers collected to be examined and considered and used to help decision making. Data in today's times is also information that can be stored in electronic form. The last two sessions of the FDP highlighted the importance of data in social media marketing in the form of data analytics, and also we deliberated how data can lead to innovations and entrepreneurship in media and entertainment industry. So the tone is set for today's session on the increasingly journalistic inclinations towards data journalism and data visualization. I also deem it an honor to welcome and introduce the esteemed speaker for today's session, Mr. Anjan Chakraborty. Anjan Chakraborty, sir, is a journalist turned entrepreneur, startup consultant, and digital media coach. He is currently the co-founder of and CEO of Eco, uh, eStory Infocom, a cybersecurity consultancy and training firm based in Calcutta. He is the guest faculty for digital media at the Heritage Academy, Kolkata, and course director of data storytelling and visualization as at newswriters.in. He is also the course direct director of digital journalism and digital marketing at Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Mandira Residential College, Belur Mat. He has worked with the Union Ministry of uh, Education's Innovation Cell as an evaluator for the Smart India Hackathon 2022. Earlier, in an extensive uh, career spanning uh, 19 years as a professional journalist, he has worked with AVP Group, Reuters, Hindustan Times and the Statesman. As a digital newsroom trainer, he has trained over 100 working journalists at uh, Reuters Bangalore and AVP Group, Kolkata. I heartily welcome you, sir, to this session. With your immense experiences in this field, we look forward to a dialectic deliberation on the significance of data in digital journalism. Uh, dear participants, you can post your questions uh, to the guest speaker in the chat box during and after the session. We will take up your questions at the end of the talk. Now, without uh, much further ado, I request our uh, guest speaker, Anjan, sir, to share insights on the topic data journalism and data visualization. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sudeshna, uh, for that uh, very generous introduction. And thank you for inviting me to deliver this talk on data journalism and visualization. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, I mean, uh, in today's world, uh, the entire ecosystem of business is revolving around data. And when I say business, it's every business. Uh, every business today in the world is basically driven by data. And it is driven by decisions made out of data. Uh, and journalism, media is no different. Uh, though in India, 
this is something that has really come up in the past five years or so. So I would say sometime around 2017, 2016 is when Indian newsrooms uh, started uh, to have uh, an inclination towards data-driven journalism and data-driven storytelling. So uh, as we increasingly look forward to uh, you know, newer technologies and newer disruptions that are going to impact the media industry and especially uh, journalism, how content is produced, how content is packaged, how content is distributed. Uh, data and data-driven journalism is going to be one of the, I believe, pillars of where the next growth of journalism and uh, storytelling is going to happen. Uh, so quickly, if I can, I'll just share my screen and uh, we can start with today's deliberation. I hope my audio is pretty sound and everybody yes. is able to hear it. Yes. Okay, is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, screen is also visible, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, so <clears throat> the few touch points that we are going to discuss today related to uh, data journalism and visualization. Uh, first of all, what is data journalism? Uh, we have a lot of misconceptions about what this exactly is, or we might have uh, you know, uh, an understanding that's not accurate. So we'll delve on what exactly is data journalism. Uh, next, of course, how to do data journalism, how it is done, uh, the processes that are involved, and it starts with finding data, then it goes on to cleaning data, then there is contextualize, how do you contextualize data, uh, combining data, and finally visualizing data. So what you see on the right of my screen is actually a visualization. And it's a data visualization of women parliamentarians worldwide from 1997 to the year 2020, uh, how many women were representing uh, their constituencies in their respective parliaments, uh, respective countries. So you can see how this is particular, this is a numeric data, it's basic statistics uh, that has been uh, collected by the Interplanetary Union uh, and United Nations uh, Women Council. And they, they found this data from different countries from 97 to 2020, so that's almost 23 years. And they kind of showed this data in the form of a beautiful vis visualization. And it, you know, uh, it, just by looking at this visualization, one can see how from 1997, where uh, representatives, women representatives in parliaments were around less than 12%. And how it has grown to you know almost 25% in 2020. And as we go forward, this uh, I believe we don't have data for last three years. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, if we check now, this 25% would eventually come to maybe around 30% or so. Uh, especially in Europe, as more and more women are representing their constituencies in their respective parliaments. So this is simple data, but how that data has been somebody found that data cleaned it up and you know in contextualized it in today's world and it it shows how how uh, more and more women are now finding representations in the parliaments of the world uh, across different countries so uh, that's one simple visualization but visualization is basically the last step it's the last uh, step of data journalism so what is data journalism. Uh, I mean, when we have all, I'm pretty sure, heard this term, right? Data journalism, data storytelling. We have heard this a lot, especially in the last five to six years. I'm pretty sure we have heard it. What exactly is data journalism? Uh, the very simple way to describe data journalism is basically the process of using data and visualization techniques to communicate certain insights and information effectively to an audience. That's that's the very basic, uh, I would say, definition or understanding of uh, what data journalism uh, is all about. And uh, while 
when I talk about data and visualization techniques, it basically combines two aspects. Uh, one is the analytical aspect, the, the, the mind, the thinking, and finding stories in a certain data set, in certain statistics, in certain reports, finding those statistics, then finding stories in those statistics, and then doing some data analysis, which is the technical aspect of it, and then combining them into a storytelling. But the storytelling is such that data and data visualization part of the story is only a part of my story narrative. It's not the entire story. It's just a part of the narrative that I'm writing for a larger story, right? So it's we are able to make these data-driven narratives uh, more compelling, more engaging, and of course, more understanding. Uh, just looking at a visualization is not the entire story. So it is something that needs to be intertwined into other aspects of stories, which is text and photos. And it gives a context. It gives a context and it, it makes very easy understanding. At the same time, it is engaging for the audience, for the reader who is looking at it. Uh, the ultimate goal of data journalism is to inspire action or decision making. That's the that's the goal. I mean, why should people do data journalism? Why are people doing data journalism? Why is so much data being you know collected and data being cleaned, combined, contextualized, and visualized? Why? Because we want to inspire action. We want to drive a decision making from the powers that be. It can be governments, it can be companies, it can be NGOs, it can be you know bodies like the United Nations. We see a lot of data-driven storytelling, sole purpose, inspire action and decision making. But the one big caveat when it comes to data and data journalism, and this is with all data and any kinds of data, it's about maintaining data accuracy, right? Because there is a lot of data that we kind of get from a lot of internet sources. Most of them may not be have an authoritative source, an authenticated source. Uh, the methodology of how the data is corrected, collected may not be the right methodologies. So it is very important to maintain data accuracy and integrity. That's very crucial part. And uh, I mean, for the simple reason that when you're presenting incorrect or you know, misleading data, it can practically undermine the credibility of the narrative and credibility of the media or that journalism uh, or that media house or the journalist per se. And this has happened in the past. We have seen a lot of incidents where you know data has been misrepresented, misinterpreted, and automatically uh, it has not been able to uh, correlate with the story narrative or it has not been able to tell the actual story. So that's the big caveat in data journalism is about maintaining the accuracy and integrity of data uh, on the basis of which my entire story uh, stands or my contextualization of data stands. So that's the big caveat when it comes to data journalism. <clears throat> Quickly moving on what or rather how to do data journalism. Uh, data journalism, people think that, you know, uh, we can take up some statistics, some Excel sheet from somewhere and build pie charts and bar charts, and that is data journals. Uh, actually, that's not. I mean, there, there are a lot of things involved uh, in, uh, in the process of how data journalism is done. And uh, it is actually a process, and there are five steps involved in that process. These are clear five steps. So the first, uh, the cycle, of uh, production for data journalism or data stories starts with finding data, compiling data. You know, that's the first and the most important step, finding and compiling data. The second step is cleaning data. You cannot use the data that you have found from somewhere in the internet and use it as it is. You need to clean it up. That's the second part. Third part is contextualize. Contextualize means we need to find a story in that data. We need to find a particular trend or a particular aberration in that data. And that is where the story is. Stories mostly lie in trends, 
if you are able to spot a particular trend in that data and when you are able to uh, spot a certain aberration in that data that's when you are able to actually that okay this can be a potential story after you contextualize that this can be a potential story then it comes to combining data sometimes one single data set that you get from an internet source is not enough to tell the whole story to tell the whole picture so you may have to find more data sets combine them with your original data set and then you will be able to contextualize your story better so if that is the fourth step it means combining different data sets and finding correlation between them and finding a context that can be much bigger than the original context you found in the original data set uh, that you have worked on. So combining data is step number four. And the last uh, process that is involved in data journalism is visualizing data and visualizing data by what we actually mean is visualize it in the form of a graphic in the form form of an interactive graphic, motion graphic, and there are lots of tools uh, that are available uh, that we use in order to uh, visualize or create th those beautiful visualizations. There are lots of templates available in a lot of uh, different online uh, platforms that are used uh, in order to uh, basically transfer the data and make beautiful visualizations out of them. This is basically the five step process. And in every step, two things need to be maintained, integrity and accuracy. In every step, integrity and accuracy with the data needs to be maintained. So it's a process. It's a time taking process. It's not something that you know somebody will be able to do in an hour or two hours. Sometimes producing good data stories can take days it can even take months so it's a lot of a uh, lot of work that goes inside you know producing a data driven story and producing those great data visualizations so <clears throat> we have all uh, are aware of the inverted pyramid style of writing right when we are writing news stories per se so when we are writing news stories we have always uh, i mean uh, we have always been told about, you know, write it in an inverted pyramid style, right? The most important thing comes on top and then uh, chronologically you move on to the least important things. So that's the typical inverted pyramid of, of, of uh, news reports that uh, we have been taught and we have been practicing in journalism. When it comes to data journalism, there's also a particular inverted pyramid that is followed and that pyramid is goes like this. It's the five C's. It is called the five C's of data journalism. Compile, clean, context, combine, communicate. So this is the five C's of data journalism. And the person uh, who is credited to have developed this in inverted pyramid of data journalism is a professor called Jeff South. Uh, Jeff is an associate professor emeritus at the Robertson School of uh, media and culture at the Virginia Commonwealth University in uh, in Virginia, USA. And uh, Jeff has, I think, he did 20 years of journalism and then moved on to academics and he did another 20 year of teaching and he was teaching uh, journalism at uh, VCU. So he's the one who is credited with uh, basically uh, inventing this five C's of data journalism. And this is exactly how it is followed across the world, across newsrooms, across media companies who actually do data journalism. Uh, first step, as I said, find data. Where do you find data? Where can we find data in today's world? Primarily internet, right? Everything is available in on the internet. There are government websites, central government, state government. There are very uh, company websites. Uh, there are different organizations like United Nations, uh, IMF, World Bank. Everybody is producing data and putting them up on their website. So it's internet where we find data, right? But the idea is finding authentic and structured data because most of the data that we find over the internet is not pretty well structured. It may not 
it may not be authentic. It may not be, you know, uh, the data may not have been collected in a method in, in proper methodology. And uh, so it, it's very important to understand and find out, you know, about how this data was collected in first place. Uh, then only we'll be able to understand, OK, the data that I have found is authentic. It is coming from an authoritative source and it is pretty much structured and you, I can prop potentially use that particular data. Uh, as I said, the usual way is to find it from online and authoritative sources. Before online, what we used to do is we used to visit basically libraries, we used to visit various government departments, get their annual reports, and from them, we have, we have to get data. But now everything is online, so we can get them online. But when it comes to searching for data online, there has to be a very, uh, you have to be very smart. I mean, uh, there are smart tricks to actually search for data on various search engines, whether it's Google or Yahoo or Bing or wherever you are trying to find that kind of data. So it, you need to employ certain smart search tricks, you know, how to get easily get data uh, that is available in the form maybe of a PDF or maybe an Excel sheet. So how do you get exactly those uh, uh, those particular results in your search and you basically are able to uh, kind of discount all the other links that do not actually have data sets with them. So that is one thing uh, about employing those smart uh, search tricks. Uh, second, of course, the big, big uh, advantage for those who are using Google data set search. So Google data set search is different from Google search, right? Uh, Google dataset search is basically Google's search engine, but it is only for data. Uh, it's only for data. I mean, when you are going to Google dataset search and searching for certain kinds of data, the, the results that you get is only in the form of Excel sheets, only in the form of PDFs, and you can download and there is uh, the source is quoted, the methodology of collecting that data is quoted. So you are able to actually uh, you know uh, find authentic data by using ah, online class the department the class teacher hello am i audible yes sir yes sir uh, someone was on unmute so we okay yes so uh, uh, how many of you just to uh, yes. just to have a conversational uh, uh, aspect of this talk? How many of you have actually used Google Dataset Search? Google Dataset Search is not something that's only used by journalists. Researchers, research scholars, they use Google Dataset Search as well. So, uh, anyone in this uh, in this group who has already used Google Dataset Search or know how to use it? Anyone? Any anyone has already used it? So I'll just uh, my screen is visible, right? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So if you just go to Google and just type Google dataset search, okay? And this is the dataset uh, search that will come up. It is this is the Google's search engine, but it's only for data. You see, this is what will open up. This is not your average Google search screen. Uh, this is actually a, a, a search engine developed by Google, but you only get data and you only get them in specific formats. So if I search for India, you know, suppose I'm looking for India and it will clearly give you what kind of data is available in different uh, websites and these data is available only in the form of certain files as excel sheets or pdfs sometimes they are available in zip folders and that they they quote the source where it is available they will be able to quote what exactly is the data so for example india food prices this data set con contains food price data for india and this is updated last on september 4th and it, you will be able to get details of, you know, uh, authors and description, when, where was it sourced from, and, you know, other details. So you will be able to understand whether we will be able to use it. And you can go to Kaggle. Kaggle is one of the sites which basically does a lot of data collection 
and it stores that data in and it also gives out that data to everybody for free so you'll be able to check so you can see in the left hand side census data uh, indonesian exports to india so you you will find data as updated as august 15 2023 which is india consolidated fiscal balance you will find cars data set you know in 2022 you will find covid data lots of data this is compiled uh, in one place and you know india wholesale price average they have specifically looked at the price of tomatoes i mean a couple of months back we all are aware that tomatoes were selling at 200 rupees a kilo right and so the this this particular uh, data set is updated till till june and they will give you uh, how tomato prices in india have gone through a cycle of inflation deflation throughout a range of uh, you know many years uh, median age so you get lots india's largest companies commonwealth winners list i mean there are tons of data that's available you can even get specific data i've i've used a very broad term so you can actually search for elections are coming up i mean just today we know that you know uh, election commission has announced the uh, uh, the five states that will go for assembly elections in november today so there are a lot of election data sets. Election is one of the time when, you know, this data is used in stories, right? I mean, across media companies, whether print, uh, digital or, or, or uh, television. So a lot of Indian election related data sets are available. And these are, you can just simply look at which ones may be able, you will maybe able to use for the next elections and uh, you can actually get the data set. So, this is a very, very uh, useful tool, uh, data set search by Google. And this is very useful for journalists. Journalists use this tool. Uh, very useful for research scholars, uh, researchers who are you know, uh, trying to get uh, uh, data uh, uh, about their particular research topic or their subject. So they also use this Google data set search. And I would uh, uh, suggest that this is something everyone should try, try to explore and they will be able to get a lot of uh, you know uh, data that has authenticated updated sourced correctly and you will be able to find them uh, so that's about uh, the data set search and it's about finding data so after the first step the second step is about cleaning data now uh, we sometimes the data that we are able to find and we are able to download uh, it may not be clean. What does I mean when it say it's not clean? So data cleaning is basically the process of fixing a lot of errors in the data. Uh, it involves basically removing incorrect, corrupted, incorrectly formatted, duplicate or incomplete data. You know, there are many files that we will find on the Internet where, you know, certain rows have been repeated. So there is duplicate data or, you know, there is certain uh, number or certain uh, uh, alphabet or digit that is not uh, exactly showing up correctly on an Excel sheet or it is incomplete, certain row is blank. So all of that uh, needs to be cleaned up uh, in order to you know, find the uh, 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 usable data set for my uh, understanding. I need a usable data set. So we have to remove these unwanted observations from the data set it, including those duplicate observations, irrelevant observations. So that process is called basically uh, cleaning of data. And we even remove structural errors. I mean, structural errors could be you know, as simple as some typos, some incorrect capitalizations, or you know, strange naming con uh, conventions. You know, sometimes you will find in some data set, you know, if, you, if it is about people, uh, you will find in some data set, you have the first name and then last name. And in certain data set, you will have the last name coming first and the first name coming second, right? So there are a lot of different uh, formats that, uh, that are available in these Excel sheets. We need to correct those structural errors. So this is the process of cleaning up the data that you have found on the internet that you think is authentic, coming from an authoritative source, and you want to use that. Before you use that, you need to clean up so that you are able to find the context uh, that you want to find or if possible uh, you, you know you you want to narrate in a in, in a story so it's the second step is all about cleaning up that data 
uh, filter anything that is unwanted and uh, we don't use the entire data set that we find we might use a fragment of that data set it is possible and uh, we might negate certain missing elements we might include some new elements so that that process is also uh, a part of the cleaning process of data uh, the third step is about contextualize. Contextualize, as, as I said, is very important where you actually try to understand. Try to understand the data. Try to understand is there a, is there, if they, it, you have to ask certain questions. When I said you try to understand data, it means who gathered this data? How was it gathered? What is the process of collection? What is the methodology? how did they what are the questions they asked in order to get this data who is reporting this data all of these questions need to be asked when i'm trying to contextualize uh, the data once that we, we are able to understand we can then actually use it first find a story and then use it in for a story so uh, it's very important to do that uh, the fourth step is simple combining Sometimes a single data set may not be able to tell you the entire story, right? We need to find other data sets, combine them with my original data set, and then I will be able to find a larger story, maybe a larger trend, maybe a very peculiar trend, and that can become the story. In fact, uh, in many cases, what, what we have found, I mean, through my journey, that a single data set, uh, I mean, many people prefer to use single data set because, of course, it's much easier. It's less time consuming to build stories and narratives around those data sets. But when you're using compiling different different data sets and combining them together, you're able to find more in the in, in the story. So journalists use, of course, a, a set of data to get more information about the story. And most important thing to understand is data is only part of the story data is not the entire story right it's only one part of the story that i'm trying to convey and it's basically a proof it basically gives the the data and that visualization of data gives actual proof to the reader and it basically i'm able to substantiate the story that i'm trying to tell so it's only a part of the narrative and data needs to be combined with you know text uh, photos sometimes videos sometimes any other interactive elements and then you are able to actually deliver an analytical or an interpretative story. And these stories are usually long form stories. So obviously, as I say, keep saying it, it's only a part of the story narrative. It's not the entire narrative and it needs to be combined with other forms and formats of content. And only then I'll be able to have, uh, you know, an analytical story or an interpretative story or it can be a discovery story as well. Sometimes you discovered something else. You know, government is reporting something in a press conference gives out data, but you find some anomaly in that data. So you are able to send a discovery story as well. So what you are saying actually, and what I have found is actually different. So you are actually hiding. And there are a lot of times we have found that, you know, uh, when these statistics are released, they will only jot down the key points and people will not look through those statistics and just do the story on the basis of those bullet points that are given out. But when you actually delve deeper into that statistics that is being handed out, you might find a different story, which, which, which the person who is holding the press conference doesn't want you to actually focus on. So uh, it's important to combine data in the, those steps. And the final, after combining data, after you have found contextualized and found your story, how do you represent that data in the form of visualization? in the form of a visualization which allows for easy communication and easy consumption for the reader. Uh, data visualization is very important to allow the reader to understand what exactly you are trying to say. They are able to interact with it. So there are lots of online tools that are available that uh, are used to create these data visualizations. But before you go there, before you go to the step of data visualization, we need to have an understanding, a basic understanding of Microsoft Excel and Google Sheets. Now, we know how to create Excel Sheets and Google Sheets, but there are certain techniques, there are certain tricks uh, uh, which are a bit advanced level that we need to learn uh, in order to you know, uh, get a clean uh, data and transfer them to a visualization. So if some basic skills uh, are very much required. 
uh, when it comes to uh, visualization and the basic skills is in the form of Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets because that's basically the source from which data is pulled into a visualization and we are able to see a wonderful graphic in front of us. So basic skills are required. And of course, we need to understand about various digital file types and file consumptions, right? So uh, we are we are aware of doc file, Excel file, PDF file. There are certain other files that are used in order to create visualization or rather in order to create the source data for the visualization. So there are, there are CSV files, there are JSON files. So there are certain other forms of files. So we need to understand how do I convert? I have data in the form of a PDF. So how do I convert that into a, a, a JSON? Or how do I convert that into a CSV file? I mean, all those conversions and file types we need to have a understanding of. And finally, the tools, uh, the tools that we that we use uh, uh, primarily media organizations around the world, businesses around the world, uh, they use these uh, tools. These are Plotly, Microsoft Power BI. We've got Tableau, Kepler, Datamatic, Flourish, Data Wrapper, Infogram. Uh, these are these are some are very very uh, beginners level. So an infogram, a, a data matic, and a data wrapper. These are these are usually very beginner level uh, tools that I believe everybody can be able to use them if you work with them for a couple of days or maybe a week. Uh, there are some tools that are a bit advanced level. So uh, whether it is Kepler whether it is Tableau or Microsoft Power BI and Flourish and Plotly, they are a bit advanced level. You need to have a bit more you know, uh, technical knowledge and skills uh, in order to you know, uh, basically uh, ruffle your hands on these particular tools. But these are the ones that uh, primarily uh, businesses, media companies, journalists, researchers, they use uh, when they want to transfer the data into a, into a very compelling uh, very, very intriguing visualization. Uh, I'll just quickly <clears throat> run you to some of these, uh, some of uh, one of the tool that I usually prefer and when I'm using and it's called Flourish. Uh, so uh, this is this, uh, this is a very, uh, this is the Flourish data visualization and storytelling. So the website, you just go and type Flourish in Google and the Flourish Studio uh, web application will open. And this is how it looks like. This is the home page of, uh, of Flourish. And uh, you can, there are various things that you, are, you will be able to create uh, through this particular tool. And you just have to create an account here. Uh, so I already have an account. So you can create your account using your Gmail ID or using your own uh, username and password you can create. And you, this tool actually allows you to create a lot of free projects. Uh, you, you can create as many number of projects that you want to create. And other uh, important thing uh, about this Flourish tool is there are a lot of pre-built uh, templates, right? And uh, these are there, are there are line bar pie charts. Uh, there are projection maps. You know, we have seen lots of these maps in, in television and digital and uh, there are scatter plots. So there are very different, different kinds of designs when it comes to visualization. And most of these uh, different types of visualizations are available on Flourish. Uh, you bar chart race, hierarchy to cards to chord diagram, uh, countdowns. I mean, there are tons of them that are available. Uh, one caveat again here is that not all the templates are available for free. So in certain templates, you will find that there is a star mark. So like calculator, you will find you know a star mark here, which means that this is a premium product and we need to buy a subscription in order to use this. But there are tons of free, uh, free uh, visualization templates that are available that can be uh, used pretty pretty uh, by anybody. I mean, we need to just learn about uh, you know how to use them. So uh, these are the various projects that you know I have been able to build, and uh, I just wanted to show you some of them quickly so that you have an understanding of how exactly visualization tools work and what exactly one person has to do in order to use these tools. Uh, so uh, I would uh, 
look at now there is another i would say i won't say a misconception but i would say a prejudice uh, when it comes to data we when we talk about data we always talk about numbers we are always thinking of it is always in the form of statistics it's always numeric it's always numbers but that's not the case i mean there you can have data in the form of information as well so this is a particular visualization uh it's for uh, it's been created for to showcase all the medals uh, that india has won in olympics since india started competing in in the olympics till the last olympic which was in tokyo right the last olympics uh so all the indian athletes who have won medals for india in the olympics this data visualization is showing all those sports persons right and uh, as a as a reader i'm basically looking at a single page and i'm able to understand you know the 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 medals that they have won and also what i can do as a reader i'm able to interact with this visualization so i'm i only so you can see there is something called all and there are certain disciplines when you click on this drop down button so you can actually check discipline wise sporting discipline wise what are the medals that india won or you can also look at you know the different medals gold bronze and silver so if i click on gold it will only show me the gold medals that india has won so india has only won two individual gold medals in olympics so far abhinav bindra for shooting and neeraj chopra in last tokyo olympics in 2020 so and rest have been all in hockey the national hockey team they have won six gold medals so if you want to look at you know the only the silver medals who which are the athletes who won only silver medals for india and you will find this this visualization is able to uh, uh, filter out the rest and give you only the silver medals you want to look at the bronze medals again you will be able to see exactly the athletes the the sport and the year in which they they have won if you want to you know even dig deeper and get down into a particular uh, discipline so i want shooting and bronze medal so shooting bronze medal is only one gold medal is only one and silver medals are two so you can have even go deep down and find a particular discipline and look at who won what uh, so this this data visualization is not created with numeric data it is created with information what you have is a picture and text but what the reader gets in one single page is basically the entire information of india's performance medal performances in the olympics since they began till the last olympics and this is something that a media organization when they have created it they can use it over time you know every new olympic comes up and before that i can showcase this page to my reader and when the next olympic happens which is next year 2023 in paris and we'll know the 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 athletes who will win medals i can just update this particular data set that i have and it will show uh, data till 2023 so this is something i can constantly reuse for my readers you know i can ov obviously reuse them uh, repurpose them in my storytelling and my narrative that i am building uh, with my olympic coverage uh for the sports team of any media company so this is one thing that we should not always uh, you know uh, have a prejudice that when it comes to data journalism it's always with numbers it may not be it can just be with information and this is a classic example of that but when you look at this is how this is the front end right and i will just uh if i can chat and you can have a look uh yes nishita ms excel skill is indispensable so i've just uh, pinged in the chat room this particular this particular visualization and you can you know check yourself how it is working but what is behind this this is something that the reader is able to see the audience is see so you see this blue button is the preview and the data this is the data button so this is the background this is where this is the source of that visualization and you will see that information has been put into rows and columns right and it's a huge i mean there is there are columns called name which is the athlete name 
we have an image for that athlete there is a text describing the particular medal and the athlete that the uh, one in a particular olympic games which sport which medal and which year so there are columns and there are yes, rows on the basis of this this particular sheet this is basically a sheet right it's basically a google sheet or an excel sheet and based on this entire data source we are able to see this this is what flourish is going to create for you what i have to create as a data journalist or a researcher that i have to basically give flourish this particular information in a particular format that they want now you can upload data in the, here and there are, you will find that a certain files only that flourish is able to support right upload data file you can only upload excel csv tsv json and geojson files when you are trying to use them for any kind of visualization you can when you want to you know i was talking about combining data set two different data sets or three different data sets you are trying to combine so it has an option of upload data and merge data so again only there are particular file types that are supported so you need to have understanding of these file types excel csv i think we all are, have heard of this there is tsv json and geojson files as well so you can only have structured data in a particular format and use them as a source for your visualization in this particular tool that's called flourish and i'll just uh, show us now this is data visualization with information right uh, what about numbers i mean that is something that we all believe that you know that is what uh, data is journalism or storytelling is all about it's it always has to be numbers so <clears throat> this is this is a different visualization it is a visualization of daily covid-19 cases uh, in top states in india in january 2021 this was the second wave and uh, the source of this data is union ministry of uh, health and family welfare and it only uh, looks at you know top states and the numbers and how those numbers changed between one single week so i'm looking at a 12th jan 2021 to 18th jan 2021 just this and i will just look at how the numbers are changing and the ranks of the states are changing and it it is it is kind of a motion graph it's definitely a line graph but the line graph is in motion so and you can look at it by score you can look at it by rank right and you just hit the replay button and you will you will see how states are moving up and down over a period of just 7 days in reporting the number of covid-19 cases so delhi for example you will see in just a span of one week it was number 6 so this only takes into account seven top states that were reporting most number most number of covid cases so delhi started the week at number 6 right delhi actually started the week at number 6 but from number 6 by the end of the week it was number 1 uh there are karnataka for example it was at number 2 position on 12th of uh, january uh, in terms of the number of cases it was reporting daily but by the end of the week it came down to fourth position its rank was number 4 and similarly you can see how the top states so delhi you see suddenly it peaked while states like karnataka dropped states like even west bengal dropped states like tamil nadu dropped so you will see how you know state wise the top states just 7 days how covid cases and you can just replay this and there are two ways to replay one is rank wise and the other is just the score wise so this is a, again a beautiful representation of data visually very attractive and the audience is able to interact with this you know it, they are able to interact through ranks and scores and replay it and it is kind of like a gaming experience that i am providing to my serious news reader right but it's he he or she is really engaged and this is something that is easily shareable right uh, so that is why you know uh, simple data this is nothing but simple covid data and you will see in this data set when i look back at how this data is uh, actually sourced inside flourish this is just states date wise columns are there the state names and the numbers have been listed that's it a simple excel sheet 
And by just using this simple Excel sheet as a source, uh, this is what I'm able to you know, generate. And this is what I can embed in my website. So uh, once you are publishing such data visualizations, you will see on the right top, uh, top, top right corner, you know, you can share them on Facebook, Twitter, you can email, and there is an option called embed, right? This is the embed code of this visualization. And this can be embedded in a website, in that story, uh, whichever place in the story narrative that I want to embed this. So it's pretty easy as far as embedding is concerned. Uh, uh, using this inside your story is concerned. It's pretty easy to embed such uh, visualizations inside uh, your story. And uh, you can also, uh, you know, like when you are looking at the back end of the story, of this particular visualization, you will find, you know, that there is uh, a, a embed code available here as well. You know, uh, you can even have options uh, like which you want it in an iframe format. Uh, you can even download this as a form of an image, right? If you want just this to be shown as an image, you will be able to use this uh, as a just an image, static image, and use it in maybe a, a print publication if you want to. So this is a tool that allows different formats the, of downloading, publishing, and embedding. So it's it's a pretty pretty useful tool when it comes to uh, visualizing uh, uh, data. Uh, there are there are other examples and uh, you know uh, simpler examples. There are complex examples that you can do. So uh, this is another simple example. It's it talks about basically cyber crime cases. Uh, in tier two cities in India. So data here has been taken from the National Crime Records Bureau. They release uh, data related to crimes in India every year. And this is typically just the cyber crime cases in India, tier two cities and how they have gone. So between 2018 and 2020, so three years data, the top three tier two cities that were reporting most number of cases were Vizac, Varanasi and Prayagraj. These were the top three uh, uh, cities, tier two India that were reporting. So when I play this, I mean, it, you can see uh, basically how the numbers change, how the bar graphs change. And while you look at this in your, and it is a part of your story, you can clearly see there is a pattern, right? You can clearly spot a particular pattern of how cybercrime cases between three years how they have changed between these three cities, right? Uh, can anyone uh, give me an observation of what is the trend that you are able to spot in this data visualization? Anyone? Are you able to see a particular trend between these three years? And the three cities. Yes, right. So you clearly see that Vizac, which was number one uh, in in 2018, it is slowly reporting less and less cases. While Prayagraj, on the other hand, has doubled between 2018 and 2020. The number of uh, cases has not just doubled; it's actually almost tripled. So suddenly the epicenter of cyber crime in tier two, Prayagraj has come on top from Vizac on top in 2018 to Prayagraj. And you can see a clear shift happening. Uh, and this is a trend. And if you can get a larger duration data and you can see how these cities are, are kind of, uh, you know, showing or reporting cases of cyber crime, you might get a much deeper analysis, a much deeper narrative into that story. And now you dig deep that what is going on in Prayagraj and what the what is happening in Vizac. I mean, why this change? One city has able to, you know, cut down on the number of cyber crimes. The other city has, in fact, tripled in, in, in three years. So you spot that trend. You're able to ask the police people and what is the what what has Vizac police done right and what has the local police in Prayagraj done wrong. So actually, this is a trend that you can see, spot, ask questions, and you will be able to find answers to why this is happening. 
So this is, uh, again, as I said at the very beginning, it's only a part of the story narrative. And this gives you the visual proof uh, of what exactly you are, you are trying to say in your story. And it's you're showing it in an attractive way, an interactive way, and the reader can quickly realize just by looking at this particular visualization in a matter of seconds that yes, what exactly is going on. So these are some of the examples that I wanted to show you. And uh, I think I'll stop sharing now. And uh, yeah, so I can take questions. I think I'm right on time. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, any questions from participants? So again, uh, Miss Nishita uh, Krishna Swami has again asked: Can data journalism be a threat to journalists since they are reporting the truth with evidence or numbers? Can data journalism be a threat? Data data journalism is the strongest tool a journalist has. Uh, because when he's telling a story, when he's just reporting a story with data, numbers, and he's able to find those actual numbers, clean, it, clean that up, combine with other data sets, and present it in a visualization, you're actually doing evidence-based reporting, right? You're actually doing evidence-based reporting. So data journalism is not a threat at all. In fact, it's the strongest tool that a journalist has. Uh, to actually give a compelling narrative to the story that he or she is trying to tell. So it's not a threat at all. Uh, and I think uh, why people do data journalism is to build that narrative through evidence proof. And the evidence is not in the form of writing statistics in sentences, right? So if I write this particular story in sentences, the cybercrime cases in tier two cities, or I'm writing a story related to you know the COVID-19 cases and how Delhi came up on top within one week. Uh, and I put that data visualization in that story and a reader is looking at it and is able to understand very, very clearly and quickly and is able to interact with it. I mean, it gives that reader a very engaged feeling with, with, with the story that he or she is reading rather than just reading paragraphs of statistics that you do love. Statistics are very boring when they are written in paragraphs. I mean, uh, this I'm talking from a purely reader consumer perspective. Statistics look very bad when they are just reported in the form of sentences and paragraphs. But when they are visualized, like, you know, uh, I was showing you how they can be visualized. I think it is it is the most engaging way uh, to to attract your reader and and to help him or her understand the story better. And as we all know, I mean, any any a visual uh, memory is the strongest memory. I mean, when I'm reporting, I'm writing a story, they may remember the points of the story, but they may not remember exactly the statistics, but they will remember the visualizations. They will remember, you know, how beautiful that visualization was looking and I clicked on that and how it was actually, I saw changing patterns and I could easily spot a trend. And that is very engaging for the reader. So. Uh, I think it is the most important tool that journalists have uh, to do, you know, evidence-based, uh, compelling, interpretative and analytical stories. Uh, uh, yes. Sir, I have a question. Can Hi. I? Yes. Uh, uh, sir, uh, good evening, sir. Uh, this is uh, uh, Dr. Tivya from uh, Department of Media Studies, Riva University. Uh, sir, uh, now we are using this uh, data. Uh, say you have showed us uh, this uh, flourish. If we are using that data, uh, maybe in writing our uh, report, maybe or uh, creating a content, are they copyrighted or how do we use this data? Uh, can we just download and use it or we, do we have to give credits to them or how is it? Sir? Yes, of course, you have to give credit. We should always give credit to the source uh, from where we have found that data. So as you can see in my uh, visualizations, I have clearly mentioned in the COVID-19 uh, uh, COVID visualization, I had clearly mentioned that you know it's sourced from Union Ministry of uh, Health and Family Welfare. So you obviously, it's mandatory for everyone to quote the source 
uh, from where you have found that data and used it for your story. So it is mandatory to use, uh, to quote the source, of course. Uh, uh, sir, uh, same similar kind of content, uh, that similar kind of data can also be used in research uh, uh, paper writing. Absolutely. Yes, thank you, sir. And uh, why I'm uh, kind of emphasizing on this, and I would say, uh, so India has been uh, one of the, I would say, you know, uh, latest entrants uh, when it comes to doing data-driven storytelling. So we kind of started uh, around 2016, 2017 is when Indian media companies, they started doing uh, data journalism, database stories. But now in 2023, 20, 20, we are almost towards the end of it. More and more uh, media organizations have started recognizing the, the importance of this type of data storytelling. And more and more media houses are actually dedicating resources inside their newsrooms. They are building small teams of data journalists within the newsrooms who only work with data driven stories, right? And so, when it began in 2016, 2017, Hindustan Times in Delhi, uh, they had a small team of just three people, three journalists uh, uh, based out of the New Delhi office of HT. Uh, they uh, basically set up a team and they started doing a lot of data stories. And from that moment onwards, it slowly caught on. Uh, quickly, Mint, which is the business uh, paper and website of uh, Hindustan Times Group, they they also quickly, uh, I think around 2017 end or 2018 beginning, they set up their own data journalism team. Two or three journalists started working and I think Mint still does a lot of data driven stories. Hindu in Chennai, uh, the Hindu has a dedicated team of data data journalists. I think they, are, they have a team of four people working out of Chennai and they produce only data stories. Uh, Indian Express, uh, uh, Times of India, India Today, all of them have now started building these teams. I think India Today started in 2021 and there are even smaller newsrooms who are now recognizing the need for such kind of detailed interpretative evidence-based data visualization-based stories in order to engage their readers more and for a longer duration. So they have slowly recognizing it. And I think in you know two years time, three years time, five years time, you will find more and more people who are being uh, recruited specifically to do data-driven uh, stories. And uh, I think this is an opportunity uh, for, for aspiring, uh, aspiring uh, students who, want, who wants to join the media industry. Uh, this is also a very niche sector. Uh, there are not too many people who are working, so actually competition is far less. Uh, when I'm looking to get into a uh, newsroom, a media company as a fresher, uh, there is huge competition. There are you know, hundreds of people from when they will probably pick two or three fresh, fresh freshers to join, right? But when somebody is saying that, you know, I have data journalism skills, I can do data storytelling. I mean, that CV is going to stand out for that student. And uh, they might see, see that, you know, okay, there's a potential. I mean, this, this is a young uh, journalism student looking for a job and he or she has done, has, has skills uh, related to data and they can even show their portfolio. So Flourish, uh, you can just send the link to your future employer, this, this, this student, they can start building projects and show it. It's a visual, it's a proof. It's not just, I'm saying that I know how to do data journalism. You can actually, you know, send that link to your employer and they will look at the data visualizations that you have built and, you know, they will say, wow, I mean, uh, please come and join us. Uh, so, and it's available for free. It's learn it and you are able to uh, create these projects on Flourish for free, show them as I pin the link, anybody can just send the link across and they will be able to see, okay, so this is a, what you have built in that project. So I think it's a huge opportunity uh, for aspiring journalists for the future in the next three years. I think people in media companies have started recognizing the importance of data journalism. And I'm pretty sure they are, will be, uh, you know, trying on the lookout for 
you know, young professionals who have uh, experience or who have done projects related to data journalism. So it's a huge opportunity is what I see. Uh, yes, sir. Someone has asked, uh, again, Ishita, I believe, uh, can you please recommend a good uh, data journalism course? Uh, so that has been the question. I, I am not sure. I am not sure if uh, data journalism course is specifically taught in any university institute or any organization. I'm not very sure. Uh, there is, the, at, at least in India, uh, there are uh, certain uh, courses available, I think, in the US and also in Europe uh, where they have specific programs on uh, data, uh, data storytelling, data visualizations. Uh, India, I don't think, uh, uh, at least I'm not aware, I, I would say I'm not aware of uh, uh, any institute or organization that specifically uh, runs a course on data journalism. Uh, what happens is you may have heard of the Google News Initiative, GNI, and you may have heard of the company called uh, Data Leads in, in, in New Delhi. Uh, so Data Leads in partnership with uh, the Google uh, News Initiative, they sometimes do some short term training programs. I mean, I think five days or seven days, short, short training programs they sometimes do on this, uh, but uh, they are not very elaborate. I mean, uh, they because you cannot learn the entire process of data storytelling in five days. I gave you an overview of how it is, what it is and how it is done. If you want to really learn all the step by step processes, uh, I think ideally it will take at least a month to have a very, very, uh, you know, crystal clear understanding of how it is done. But you can explore the GNI and data leads uh, programs on, on on data data journalism, uh, data storytelling rather. Uh, but they are they conduct short term short term uh, training programs, seven days or something like that. Uh, <coughs> of a offshoot of this question, sir. In, since we are educators and uh, we design syllabuses, and I have seen you are also a course director. So, if we want to curate a course for data journalism, can you tell us? I mean, the uh, you know main components that maybe we could include in terms of uh, uh, this, and uh, you know we can uh, incorporate both uh, in terms of theory and practical. Some inputs, uh, you know, sir. If you can give us, then we we can think of which direction like you said you know uh, getting a skill is important but again how to go about imparting that skill uh, is what uh, we are uh, you know supposed to be doing so for me it is a totally uh, you know a beginner step uh, in terms of your uh, sessions like we are attending right now so how do we go about you know furthering our uh, skills and knowledge in this particular area and how to curate a minimum course maybe in terms of maybe a certificate course or you know uh, you know a, a syllabus in terms of this particular paper so your inputs will be great uh, so uh, uh, i'm not sure if i'm the right person to answer this uh, but i would say, i would say that you know uh, data journalism is not a it, it it is it cannot it can be a part of your curriculum it cannot be a course in itself in in a university or a college i think uh, maybe uh, because uh, as far as I know, you can you can have a understanding, a clear understanding of data journalism, data storytelling, and visualization uh, in a month's time, right? One month, maybe 30 classes, or maybe less, maybe in 25 classes, 25 to 30 classes, uh, a person should be able to uh, clearly understand and not just understand, but start uh, building. Uh, such projects by themselves. So I think for that purpose, a short term, you know, course uh, or maybe I don't know, a value added course. I think NEP has something called a value added course the, for first year, second year. But uh, I would not suggest this for undergraduate level uh, because this is a bit advanced. So I think this is something that ideally should be for postgraduate uh, le level students. So uh, not suggest at all for the undergraduates. Postgraduates can do it. Uh, it will probably be around uh, a month, probably take around 25 hours short term course. Uh, and there is a lot of, uh, I mean, all the skills that one needs to understand in data journalism and visualization are technical. 
so there are a lot of tools. So I just showed you data visualization tool. I showed you just one. There are seven, eight others that are in use and you need to have an understanding of at least three or four. If you are going to become a data journalist, if anyone aspires to get, get into this, uh, one person has to learn at least three or four. One person has to learn about how data is cleaned, the cleaning up process of data through Excel. And so that is again technical. So uh, getting hands on practical training on Excels and Google Sheets, that's a very technical process. Uh, combining, you know, combining different data sets to build a larger context story, that is also a very technical process. Again, something that needs to be taught hands on and practiced by those who are seeking to explore this particular stream. Uh, so curriculum, I think it's pretty easy to design a curriculum because as I said, you follow the process is fine, the five C's. So the, the curriculum has to be based on those five C's of uh, inverted pyramid of data journalism. I think curriculum can be uh, constructed, uh, can be built easily. And I think it should be part of a larger master's program, maybe you know, a month it can be incorporated. I don't know how it is incorporated. I'm not exactly an academic. So, but uh, yes, it can definitely be done. Uh, and I would suggest uh, for media educators, I think uh, get in touch with GNI and data leads and their programs that they run uh, short term. They run very short term ones, five days, seven days kind of stuff on data storytelling. So that would be a good starting point to learn. Uh, I see there is another question. Is there a difference between data journalism and data mining? Dr. Divya. Uh, Dr. Divya, yes, there is, of course, data mining is one, one particular step. Uh, data mining is basically uh, the, the process of uh, understanding uh, the anomalies or the trends in a data set. So that's data mining. Data mining, I mean, what do you know by mining? Mining is we, we, are, we are basically digging the ground to get coal or diamond or iron ore. So it's digging, right? You're digging to find something. So data mining is same. You are, you are looking at data to find a story, to find an anomaly to find a trend, to spot an aberration. So data mining is just that. Data journalism is much bigger. In data journalism, data mining is a part, is one particular process, which is, uh, which is where we say contextualized data, which is the step number three of the process. So data mining is a part of data journalism. Data journalism is much bigger. Uh, yes, sir. there is another question. How is data set sources helpful in research? Please, uh, because research is a fact finding study. Uh, Dr. Manjula has asked this question. Okay, so Dr. Manjula, I mean, uh, see research is fact finding study where you are doing your own, you are collecting information of your own. You're you are actually, it can be field research, it can be surveys, Google Forms, whatever. That's how I'm presuming you collect uh, data that will uh, help you in your research paper, right? Now, that is that is uh, first-hand information that you are trying to collect. Uh, now, that is one part, but when you are trying to combine that with already available data, you might find a different perspective. Uh, I uh, What I meant when I said that researchers, research scholars use it, they use it to find correlation. So when as a researcher, I am doing fact finding, I am trying to go on the ground and uh, doing you know, surveys or I'm doing online surveys to get certain answers. And from those answers, I will be able to draw an inference to, to, to a particular part of my research. But when it comes to correlation, building correlations, that's when data set search and data set sources come in. So you may be doing uh, your research topic uh, can be as varied as anything, but you might want to find some correlation from a historical data set or from a data set that's already available and correlate that with your own finding from the own survey that you are able to conduct on the ground or through online research. So co building correlations is where data set uh, search and data set source sources can be uh, very helpful in research is what I believe. 
thank you, sir. Um, another question is how do we understand that the data is not clean? How to find the incorrect data? Krishna Priya, sir, is asked how to understand data is not clean. So it's it's I think it's very easy when you look at an Excel sheet, right? I mean, how do we look at an Excel sheet and find columns, find rows, and 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 unable to spot whether you know any particular uh, figure is missing in a particular row, or anything is uh, not available. So what do you do then? So uh, just to give you an example, uh, I mean, this is I think last year. Uh, uh, so India releases their inflation data every quarter, right? In fact, every month, I'm sorry. The inflation data is released every month by the government of India. Uh, they report the national average, the CPI, the consumer price index. And uh, they do it all India and then they will do it statewide. So what happened in uh, 2022, so we had Jammu and Kashmir as a union territory, right? But then we had a bifurcation. So there are now two different union territories. So when government released the data in 2021 on the CPI, they gave wrong data. How? Because they described the CPI of uh, Ladakh and the CPI of, uh, of Jammu as the same. So the two UTs had the exact same figure. That cannot happen because there are now two separate entities. And when there are two separate entities, even a decimal factor difference would be there. But when they released that data and they were handed out to the press people, they found that suddenly somebody, not everybody was looking at it you know, as deeply as one should. So they found that, OK, it, earlier it was just the union territory of JNK and they used to have one single uh, data, but now they have you know, broken them into two different UTs, but the data remains the same. It's exactly the same figure. They are reporting 11.7, 11.7, same. How can it happen? It cannot happen. If at least one decimal figure difference has to be there. So that is how people understand that the data is not clean. It's about looking at that data and finding where exactly the columns, the rows, whether they match, whether whether there is there is some correlation happening. So we need to look very, very deep. So, you know, uh, uh, you, you can look at very different Excel sheets and you will be able to spot it. So that is a, you know, like journalists have, we have been heard, hearing this, no? you have nose for news, right? So same, you will be able to spot anomaly in data when you're looking at a particular Excel sheet and you'll be able to spot. So I think a few days back, the Union Ministry of Education uh, education, uh, I mean, now it's the Union Ministry of Education. They released a data about uh, the population projection of Indian uh, uh, Indian youngsters in the age group of 1 to 23. So they were looking at uh, age group of 1 to 23 projected population of Indian students because this is what they are dealing with, school, higher education, and all of that. And uh, they forgot actually in the initial uh, initial data that they sent out they forgot to add ladakh and uh, and uh, the union territory of pondicherry so they forgot pondicherry and ladakh and uh, the data set was uh, was uh, provided and it was given and people reported also lot of every media outlet practically reported but Nobody actually went in and saw in that statistics that was handed out that there are two union territories missing from that data. So what does that mean? You haven't done uh, research in those UTs or is the data not, uh, not being presented in the statistics because you don't want to show it? Are you hiding something? So there are very, these are the questions that you have to ask when you look at a data set. So there are many ways to to actually you know find anomalies in a data set to understand if this is correct or incorrect, cross check it, cross reference it, correlate it, and there are processes. And this is something again, it's a part of the learning process of data journalism. So about cleaning, how do you clean data, and you know how you're able to understand that okay, this is clean or this is unclean. Uh, yes. Any more questions? Okay. 
Uh, sir, one last uh, query actually. Uh, you mentioned this uh, software of uh, Power BI, if I am not wrong, in one of the slides. And right now, uh, when we talk to the School of Management, we are hearing a lot that they are doing courses on Power BI. So exactly, I am also not sure exactly what it entails. Can do you have any insights about that? And can you tell us a little bit? So uh, Microsoft uh, Power BI is basically uh, a, a tool uh, developed by Microsoft and uh, they have a free version and they have a paid version. And uh, uh, so I showed you uh, uh, the eight different uh, visualization tools that industries use uh, when they are doing data storytelling or visualization. Uh, Microsoft Power BI and uh, the another tool is called Tableau. These are the two tools that corporates use, businesses across FMCG, automobiles, you know, uh, electronics to F, uh, uh, aviation. So these big industries, they while doing business reporting for yeah. their you know boards and corporate meetings, they use data visualizations in their presentations in their PPTs. And uh, in that context, they prefer to use Microsoft Power BI and Tableau specifically. And these are they, there are certain uh, templates, there are certain features available in Microsoft Power BI and Tableau that enables easy, seamless, uh, 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 I would say, integration with your PowerPoint presentations or Google slide presentations. So that's why corporates prefer to use uh, Power BI and Tableau. And uh, big companies from Reliance to ITCs of the world to Tata's, they use Microsoft Power BI in their corporate uh, meetings and investor meetings and presentations. Even in their quarterly results reports, the uh, PPTs that they share, they usually have Microsoft Power BI integrations in them. So it's uh, so there is no surprise that the management school would be uh, using, uh, would be actually doing a course on Power BI and Tableau. Uh, for journalists, for media school, I think uh, tab Tableau and Power BI is is a very, very advanced level. Actually, journalists don't need uh, Power BI and uh, and Tableau. The other tools like Flourish, Data Wrapper, Datamatic, uh, Infogram, they, they are much easier, uh, much easier to, uh, to understand and much easier to a play around and so I think journalists uh, uh, would ideally prefer to use those tools instead of Power BI or Tableau. Uh, any more questions? Okay, then uh, we come to the end of our discussion. Uh, thank you, sir, for this insightful session and patiently answering all our questions. Uh, your teachings have truly inspired us. We are thankful that you could share your in-depth knowledge related to this particular field of data journalism and your experience, uh, your experience also with us. Uh, last but not the least, I would also like to convey my heartfelt thanks to all those who have joined, uh, all the participants who have joined for the session today. Uh, also, please uh, fill the feedback form. We will post it in your WhatsApp chat. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Shudesh. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.